And here we are talking Seattle Seahawks football once again on the Our Lads Football Network with Corbin Smith. Corbin, it's good to have you back. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it as always. All right. No, it's a busy time, Corbin. So we're going to get right to it. Just want to remind everybody, you can check out uh, Corbin's work and we will leave links in the description area uh, of how you can uh, find out about uh, the SI.com work. Of course, that is specifically the URL. And again, I'm going to have a link in the description. What's the URL for that, Corbin? SI.com slash NFL slash Seahawks. All right. So Let's go ahead now, and what I'm going to do is is I am going to pop up the R Lads current depth chart uh, for uh, your viewing experience. So let's go ahead and do that for the audience here. So uh, you're going to be able to um, tag along with us as we take a look up and down the depth chart. Um, and you can see, of course, the color scheme. Uh, all the free agents are in orange. The blacks are the restricted free agents, and we're definitely going to get into that as well. Uh, we're going to talk about them all, uh, including the three that just got cut. And matter of fact, the other player that got cut too was uh, Will Disley. Um, why don't we start with tight end? Because all three tight ends, all top three tight ends for the Seahawks um, are now off the team. Currently, Fant and Parkinson are unrestricted free agents. Yeah, this really is a fascinating position. This would have been the honorable mention selection with the top five needs, just because uh, without the moves yesterday, it probably would have been number five, but safety jumped up to number two. This is a position group where I'm expecting one of those undrafted or unrestricted, excuse me, free agents to be re-signed, whether it's Fant or Parkinson. I personally would vouch for Parkinson of the two because he's a little younger, and I think he's a better all-around tight end at this point. Okay. He's really developed into a top-10 run-blocking tight end, and you just released Will Disley. So you're going to need somebody that can do a little bit of both. It's possible they could bring back both of these guys if Noah Fant does not have as much interest on the free agent market as he is hoping for. But Parkinson, to me, would be the first priority of those two. And then there, there's some intrigue with Brady Russell, who they brought in last year off the Philadelphia Eagles practice squad but I think this is a position that they are going to attack in the draft in my opinion this is one of the best tight end draft classes that we've seen in the last 15 years in really? terms of talent and depth we saw it at the combine with the way these guys are running and jumping out of Lucas Oil Stadium and oh by the way they're really good football players on top of that so I expect them to draft at least one tight end. Maybe they'll sign somebody to a contract as an outside free agent, but look for one of those two unrestricted guys to come back. And there's always the possibility if Will Disley doesn't have much interest in the market, they could bring him back on a much cheaper deal. So there's a lot of flexibility at tight end. Those are high remarks because last year's tight end class was considered like the best tight end class to come around in a long time. So uh, do you just attribute that to the their athleticism, th the way, like you said, that you just they really just popped out on you at the combine? Or are you also talking about overall depth of the tight end spot this year? I think this is the best depth we have seen at that position really in the last 10 to 15 years. I don't know that it's the best blue chip class at that position, although Brock Bowers would certainly be considered a blue oh, yeah. chip player. But there, I could see six or seven tight ends going in the first three rounds. That's okay. the kind of talent that we have at this position group. I think day two, you're going to see a lot of these guys fly off the board because they're phenomenal athletes. But as I said, they're also really good players. If you look at their college statistics, their production, a lot of these guys were big contributors for their teams at the division one level. So I just think that this is a really deep talented group. If you're looking for help at tight end, this is the year to be looking for that in the draft. Okay. Now um, I also wanted to start tight end because uh, last year, Seattle's offense, um, obviously, as you know, uh, weighed heavily as far as the personnel packages by using three tight ends, two tight ends compared to the rest of the league. Well, there is now a new offensive coordinator and um, he comes over from Washington. So uh, you got the, the little ties there, which are, are, are kind of cool. We'll talk about the, the Michael Penix potential ties as well a little bit later on. Uh, but let's talk about that because this is huge. Um, anytime you take a look at how a scheme was used like that, you bring in a new coordinator, how much different will this new scheme with this new coordinator how will they differ as far as their uh, utilization with receivers and tight ends? 
I expect to see a lot more 11 personnel with Ryan Grubb with three receivers and one tight end in the field. You will still see some 12 personnel. I'd be surprised if you see much carryover, if any, with the 13 personnel groupings. And maybe Ryan Grubb turns a new leaf. He has been very adaptable at the college level. He's got an offensive line background. So in the league, maybe he'll be more willing to use multi-tight end sets. But a big part of his offense at Washington and Fresno State before that, uh, they really attack teams with 11 personnel, a lot of 10 personnel where they had four receivers on the field spreading teams out. So I'm expecting there to be a little bit different usage there, and that is going to certainly impact how they're going to handle free agency and the draft with prioritization. But I do think the tight ends that play, they were active in the passing game for Washington. Jack Westover finished third on the team in receptions last year with all the receiving talent Washington had. So sure. they will use tight ends. But it's going to be a lot more of one and two tight end sets. I don't expect to see much carryover with the three tight end sets we saw with Shane Waldron in the last few years. And maybe just the fact that, as we opened with, the top three tight ends are currently not on the roster from last year. Maybe that's a little tip off, but we'll see. Okay. Um, while we're at it, and I know we're not going to get into defense right now, but McDonald have to definitely uh, – since we're talking about the team, we have to kind of open this up a little bit with the new head coach. He's going to call plays on defense, correct? And how do you see the defensive scheme changing with McDonald here? Yeah, I think you're going to see a lot more exotic pre-snap disguises than what you saw under Pete Carroll and Clint Hurt the last few years. That is going to be the biggest difference is the pre-snap reads and what the coverages ultimately end up being. And I think that's one of the things that really appealed to John Schneider about Mike McDonald. He runs a 3-4 defense, but there's some hybrid look to it. Sometimes they'll have the four-man fronts. He is not overly aggressive blitzing. The Ravens have been in the middle of the pack the last couple of years, but when he does send defenders, he loves to send guys from the secondary, and he's been very good at it. So somebody like Devin Witherspoon, who is already an elite blitzing cornerback, that's going to be a player that Mike McDonald is going to be very excited for the opportunity to get to work with. Yeah, and, and he also, um, I mean, it's a complicated defense, so – the, the team is going to look for some highly intelligent defenders, no question, and defenders that can play multiple roles. Because, like you said, they're going to run uh, multiple uh, base defense up front, may, might and try to make it as confusing as possible for the offense. And in order to accomplish that the best way possible, you better have some smart guys back there. Um, do they have? Th does the team right now have a big nickel? They don't have a big nickel on the roster currently. I, I could see Julian Love playing that role sometimes for them, depending what they do at the safety spot right now. But here's the thing. Devin Witherspoon might not look like a big guy. He's only 185 pounds, but he could play that big nickel role. I mean, he is as big of a hitter as there is in the NFL at the quarterback spot. Sometimes to his own detriment, but he comes up and he whacks people. He has no fear defending bigger tight ends. So Seattle's got some bodies there. Kobe Bryant has held that role before, and he's a decent-sized corner. So they have some guys on the roster to be able to do that. But if they're looking for a true big-bodied nickel, maybe they could bring back somebody like Ryan Neal in free agency after he spent last year with the Buccaneers. He held that role and did a good job in his four seasons with the Seahawks. They have some flexibility there. Okay. All right, now uh, let's uh, get back to breaking down the offense. And wide receiver should be very key part of this offense, this new scheme. Uh, and again, they had probably the three best wide receivers at Washington last year, which is why they were one win away from winning the national championship. Uh, and the Seahawks have just about as talented uh, as a three wide receiver look as you're going to see out there. Um, with the veteran, I can't believe we're saying it, but yeah, Tyler Lockett's a veteran now, and so is DK Metcalf. But Smith and Jigba, of course, being taken up last year, he's gonna, you would think, have a big second season. And then you look at the backups, you got Eskridge and Bobo, um, and then Young, the seventh round draft pick from a couple of years ago. So it looks to me like this entire unit doesn't even have to be, you know, muddled around. I mean, it looks like what you see is what you're gonna get when the season begins. Yeah, you would suspect that. The only question mark there has been Tyler Lockett just because of his cap hit this year. But I okay. think after releasing Quadre Diggs, Jamal Adams, and Will Disley yesterday, 
And really, Adams, his release being an outright release rather than a post-June 1st, there's going to be no dead cap money from him on the books next year. So that makes it much more flexible for Seattle to restructure Tyler Lockett's deal. You can kick $7 million down to next year instead of 17, which it would have been at if you had a split deal with Jamal Adams when you released him. So there's more flexibility there. I'm anticipating Lockett is going to be on this roster this season, but I will be surprised if they don't do a restructure on that front. As far as the rest of this position group, I think it may be time to move on from D. Eskridge because the injuries and, and lack of production. He didn't have a single catch last year. I could see Seattle on day three selecting a receiver to supplement this group, but as long as Tyler Lockett's on the roster, there's no reason for them to invest early draft capital at that position or be aggressive in free agency. They are set here. It's probably the strongest position group on their roster. Okay. Now, uh, running back, I mean, we could say the same thing about the top two. I mean, they're set. Walker, Charbonneau. So, uh, DJ Dallas is a free agent. McIntosh is there. Uh, will McIntosh take over for Dallas, or does Dallas come back on the cheat? It depends what interest there is out there, but I would suspect that DJ Dallas isn't going to be getting much more than veterans minimum with all the stud running backs that are on the market with him. And he has been a solid kick and punt returner. So it's possible Seattle could bring him back on a one-year deal. I would suspect that would be later in free agency if they are going to do that. This is also a running back draft class that isn't, they don't have the blue collar guys. I no. wouldn't be surprised if you don't see a running back off the board until the sixties this year. It, there isn't that stud that gets drafted in the first round, but there's some really good value running backs on day three. Seattle usually picks one every year. I could see them doing that again and bringing in a third down back that they can have compete against Kenny McIntosh, who really played no offense last year in his rookie season. All right. Now uh, let's talk offensive line. And we talked about that a little while ago. And if you want to find out um, what we talked about a little while ago, uh, we'll have a link in the description so you can check out uh, the, I think it was about a five or six minute clip that we did uh, going over the top needs for Seattle, because two of those top needs were along the interior of the offensive line. Three of those guys are free agents, Lewis Brown and Haynes. So uh, let's start there. I mean, there are five free agents in all on the offensive line, including one restricted free agent. Uh, how do you think they're going to go about changing the interior of their offensive line. I think the only one of those players, I'd maybe make an argument for two. Damian Lewis, it depends what the market looks like for him with other teams because he is a four-year starter. Seattle averaged almost five and a half yards per carry last year when they ran behind him. He's been a really good run blocker. Pass protection has been a little more inconsistent. He just hasn't made that jump since his rookie year that I think everybody in Seattle was hoping for. And who knows what new offensive line coach Scott Huff thinks about this process. He may want to bring in a completely new yeah. group of players. So uh, Lewis, to me, would be a 50-50 proposition. Evan Brown, as I mentioned earlier in the show, isn't going to be expensive to re-sign. I think he was a capable starter last year, but I would expect Olu Olu Timmy's going to get every opportunity to win this starting job, or they might bring in somebody early in the draft this year. Right guard Anthony Bradford's probably the projected starter right now. Haynes has just had enough injuries. I don't know if they're going to bring him back for another season. If they do, it'll be on the league minimum. Maybe that is a possibility, but I'm expecting a lot of new names there. And with a new regime, maybe this is a position the Seahawks are more aggressive in free agency. In the past, they were not with offensive linemen, but I'm wondering if Mike McDonald and this new coaching staff, maybe that sways things. And who knows? Josh Schneider now has full personnel power. He might be wanting to shift towards investing more in that offensive line. And there will be some guys available in free agency that could be upgrades to this position. Yeah. Well, we're going to talk about a lot of those rookies and Bradford is one of them. So uh, I know it's not like he had a whole lot of playing time, but um the, what is the team and, and it is a, a new coaching staff but um well what is schneider what, what do you think the team feels about bradford and do you think they'll feel comfortable if he is starting on opening day yeah i think the seahawks have a lot of confidence in him taking a big step forward this year he had his struggles in pass protection as a rookie but there were also some plays that jumped out in run blocking where he was able to maul people so if the, if this really boils down to what ryan grubb and scott huff want on offense. Do they want more athletic linemen that are movers? Bradford actually moves pretty well for 330 pounds, but 
there are some linemen in this draft class that are more athletic, have a little more lateral mobility. If they're wanting to run a zone game or they're expecting to do a lot of pulling with their guards like Washington did last year, then I would suspect that they're going to be looking for some players that are a better fit schematically. If they want to get downhill and whack people, then bring back Damian Lewis, keep Anthony Bradford. You've got two guys that really fit that scheme well. So it's going to boil down to what kind of personnel that the new offensive coaches want. Any guess which way they'll... I think they'll lean towards athleticism. And that doesn't mean that Anthony Bradford's completely out of the mix because, again, he's a pretty darn good athlete for 330 pounds. But uh, his game has been predicated on knocking people off the line of scrimmage. And Seattle may still invest in him for the future, but I'm expecting that they're going to be looking for some more athletic guys that can really get after defenders as pullers and can function in the zone blocking game as well. So I'm expecting some more athletic players to come in. Okay. And on the outside, is it just really as well, as far as Lucas, it's, it's just about health, right? Everything else, as long as these guys are healthy, these are the tackles that you're going to see on Seattle for several more years. Yeah, they're still expecting these guys to be the bookends long-term, although Lucas had knee surgery this offseason, and John Schneider, we we asked him at the Combine, do you expect this is going to fix the problem? And he said, yes, hopefully. So they are still waiting this out. This has been a chronic knee issue that has bugged him for more than a year. So we'll see if this surgery corrected it. If it does, that's great because – This guy was excellent as a rookie. He made a difference when he came back for a few games in the second half this year. And Charles Cross made some improvements this season as well. Those are the two guys that you want to build your offensive line around. But if Lucas's health is a question mark, this is a very good tackle class. So Seattle, if they decide to pick one early, that would be very revealing about where they stand on his status moving forward. Okay. And then we end at quarterback on offense. and couple of things here. Well, Locke's a free agent. That's one. Uh, Gino isn't getting any younger. And then the most obvious, uh, I don't even know if you want to say rumor or everybody's filling in their little mock drafts. The most obvious one is, is will Seattle seriously think about reuniting quarterback to offensive coordinator? Yeah, that's been the discussion with Michael Penix coming back to Seattle. I I don't think that they would do it in pick number 16. If they traded down a couple spots, then maybe that is a possibility end of the first round or even in the second round, depending on what John Schneider decides to do. I could see that being a possibility. I know the Seahawks like him, and I can understand why. He's got a live throwing arm, and honestly – he and Geno Smith have very similar skill sets. So I think having those two together would make a lot of sense. And they have a close relationship. I mean, they've been the two quarterbacks that have owned Seattle the last two years. So why not keep both of them together? But I think there are a couple other quarterbacks that could be in the mix here too. I have been told the Seahawks love J.J. McCarthy. So we'll see whether or not they decide to try to move up. They don't have the capital necessarily to do that at the same time. John Schneider might be willing to give up a lot of future draft capital to move up a few spots if McCarthy is available. There's some day two guys that could be in the mix. I know they met with Michael Pratt from Tulane. He has a lot of the skills that they look for at the quarterback position, a really cerebral guy that's also athletic. So I do expect them to draft a quarterback. The question is going to be, are they investing a pick early or are they going to wait until later in the draft? But expect John Schneider to pick the third quarterback. I can't believe I'm saying this his third quarterback in 15 years as general manager. They have just not drafted him, which is surprising given his Green Bay roots. Okay, so let's, let's uh, touch up on that uh, draft capital uh, w- uh, as, as we make the move from offense to defense. So wh- what's, uh, what does it look like right now? They don't have a pick in the second round because they traded it to the Giants for Leonard Williams last year. I know a lot of Seahawks fans don't like that trade in retrospect. I thought it was a great trade, and Leonard Williams was not the reason the Seahawks missed the playoffs. He actually played really well after they acquired him. So they don't have a second rounder for that reason. So there's pick number 16, and then they don't pick until pick number 76 in the third round. They do have two third rounders in a three-pick span. They got one from the Denver Broncos last year. So they do have two third round selections at their disposal. But 
They don't have a pick in the second round. And you know, that's okay. got to be eating at John Schneider. So I think that this is a strong probability unless there is a QB there that they really want. I think it's a strong probability. The Seahawks are going to try to move down and see if they can recoup an extra day two pick or two. We've seen John Schneider do this a lot last year. He was not as active trading, but I could see this year, particularly those first two days, him trying to move up and down the board some to get some extra picks to take advantage of a draft class that I think for the most part is pretty top heavy. And there's not as much overall depth in large part because there's fewer early entrants than we've seen since 2011. Right. What a coincidence. I wonder why they're staying in college. So anyway, <laughs> uh, okay. What about potential cap casualties? We just saw two big ones, three big ones. Uh, any, uh, do you think they're done with, with, with the cutting? Well, there's a couple names that I could still throw out there. I think Brian Monet, his issue has been health. He missed all of last season recovering from a torn ACL. And the last that I heard was that he was just not making progress the way that they hoped that he would. So you've got some medical things that are preventing them from making a move on that front. But cutting him would open up more than $5 million in cap wow. space. And D. Eskridge, you're not going to save a lot of money doing that. But I could see Seattle making a move there and just letting him free uh, because it's just been a disaster in his okay. first three seasons here. So uh, other than that, they don't really have anybody else. I mean, they're not cutting Geno Smith. They're not cutting. I don't think they're cutting Tyler Lockett. I think they could do a restructure there, but I don't think there's anybody else in the roster that they're going to be moving on from. They could do some extensions. They could do some restructures, maybe sure. give Julian Love an extension after being a pro bowler last year to try to create a little cap space. But uh, as far as cap casualties go, Brian Monet is really the only one that I see that's going to net you much cap space. Okay, and uh, Locke, do you think he's back, or does that all depend on whether or not? I mean, well, first of all, you know, most of these guys are going to want to know where they're where they're at before the draft. That's for sure. Even though Drew Locke, you never know. I'm not sure how quickly he would uh, get picked up. But what do you think? Is, is there definitely an intention to bring him back or not? I think they want to have both of their veteran quarterbacks back this next season based on the comments from Ryan Grubb and Mike McDonald. I mean, there's been some, there's been some question marks. They haven't necessarily been able to be forthright on this, but Drew Locke has been brought up unprompted several times. I know that John Schneider met with his agent at the combine. So I think that they're keeping the door open there. The questions really, are there going to be any other teams that, want Drew Locke to come in to compete for a starting job or maybe Drew Locke views as a better situation to maybe get on the field because if that happens I think that money is going to talk some and the situation is going to talk some but he certainly has enjoyed playing in Seattle so this is another one that feels like a 50-50 to me and I think if they do bring him back they're going to try to have less guaranteed money on there because if they draft a QB maybe they do keep three guys in the roster but if they draft a QB particularly early you want to be in a position where you can move on from Drew Locke in August if need be. Yeah, or, or at some point before the trade deadline even. Uh, yep. that, that's a, Especially with all the – we hope we don't have another year like we had last year with all the quarterbacks that went down. Not good for the NFL, but the more quarterbacks you have on the roster, the better. Okay, now on defense, kind of start with Leonard Williams. Do you believe that they're going to have a realistic chance and do they want to bring him back? Oh, they absolutely want to. As for whether it's realistic, I'd say right now I'd be leaning 60-40 that he is back. I, I think the okay. Seahawks are going to prioritize him as their number one guy to resign, not just because of what they gave up for him, but because he played really well. And this is a guy that has been, I think, an underrated player throughout his nine-year career because he's played on a lot of bad teams. But he gets after the quarterback. He's very disruptive getting into the backfield. He has been consistently a top-tier run defender at the position. So this is a guy I think Seattle absolutely wants to bring back. And I think Mike McDonald would be excited to have him on his defense. This is a disruptive defensive tackle that fits what he wants to do. So I think he's going to do everything to make this happen. At the same time, uh, I think there is going to be a line where John Schneider is not going to cross. And if Leonard Williams wants more money, then – Ultimately, I think Seattle's going to get priced out of that point. So I'd go 60 40 because I do think he wants to be back. I think he enjoys being on the West Coast. Money's going to be the ultimate driving force here. Okay. Uh, he's one of two free agents on the defensive line. And then you also have uh, a couple of guys. You mentioned Jones before uh, who came in in his first year. 
seemed to do a pretty decent job, had a career high 49 tackles. Reed had seven sacks. I believe that was his second best output over his career. Yep. Career high 54 tackles. So they must have been pretty happy with both of those guys. Well, I think Jaron Reed was maybe the MVP of this defense when you consider oh. the entire season. I mean, he he just stepped – he really stepped up every single game, even when they got ran all over, which happened way too much. I thought Jaron Reed played really well. He was disruptive rushing the passer in terms of consistency. He okay. was the most consistent defender for the Seahawks last year. You can't say that about Draymond Jones. Yeah, he had a career high in tackles, but – didn't have the sack numbers, didn't have the pressure numbers, and really until late in the season when they slid him outside, there were a lot of games where you were just wondering, where where is 55 at? And there were just too many games where he was quiet. So they need much better production from him this year than what they got last season. And Mike McDonald's going to be tasked with that. How do you get him playing in his best in your scheme? And then taking a look at the depth around uh, these players, well, the other free agent is Edwards. Um and then you have a couple of rookies. So Young had a couple hundred snaps. Morris had the shoulder injury, so he didn't get to play much. But he does get to be reunited with his college coach. Yeah. That can only be a good thing. So talk about the depth on the defensive line. Mike Morris is still a player that I'm extremely excited about. And it's unfortunate that he had a shoulder issue he came into the NFL with that ended up flaring up and ultimately wasn't able to play more than the season opener last year. But the guy, as an end, was not an overly athletic player. He played some D-end at Michigan late in his career. But when he's playing inside at 295, 300 pounds, this guy has elite athleticism at that position. And he's got a motor. Mike McDonald knows his skill set really well. So I think that that is a player that could benefit immensely from this coaching change just with that familiarity. And I expect, as long as he's healthy off that surgery that he underwent last year, that he's going to get a lot of chances to carve out a significant role on this defensive line. And uh, how did Young do? Young was solid. He he is not going to give you much as a pass rusher. He is a pure nose tackle that is primarily going to be a run defender. There were some flash plays from him. There were also some welcome to the NFL plays where he got knocked off the ball some, which you didn't see at the college level. So I'm expecting to see him a little bit heavier coming into camp as that pure nose tackle, he's going to be in competition for snaps there. But you saw enough there to have some optimism that maybe he could be the guy at nose tackle for this team. Uh, do they bring back Edwards? I don't think so. Unless, you know, last year they signed him in May. If they get in a position where they feel like they need another veteran on the line, he does have versatility that works in the Ravens defense, in Mike McDonald's defense. He can play inside and out. I think at his age, though, at this point, the fact that he isn't much of a factor of rushing the passer either, I'd be surprised if he's back. Okay. Uh, let's talk about the all-important edge position for this team. So um, how, what kind of a career do you believe Daryl Taylor has had? He's a restricted free agent. Uh, he's had 21 and a half career sacks over three years. Has he been the type of player that you believe Seattle has expected or – do they need more out of him? I think that there have been spurts where he has played to the level they anticipated. The end of the 2022 season, for example, he had six and a half sacks in the last five games. So there have been spurts where he has been dominant rushing the passer. But then you have long stretches where he does nothing. And unfortunately, he has been nothing but a detriment to this team defending the run. Like he just he can't set the edge. He has not proven the ability to do so. He can get in the backfield and get a few tackles for loss because of his athleticism, but blockers just knock him off the line of scrimmage. He gets blown out of plays. He isn't able to set an anchor off the edge. So I think he's been a disappointment overall. There have been some stretches where he has played up to that second round pick value. And maybe in Mike McDonald's defense, he's able to really un be unleashed as a pass rusher. But I think the issue is setting the edge. That might be what ultimately set Seattle to decide, hey, we're, we're going to move on here. Or you can come back, but it isn't going to be on a restricted free agent tender. It's going to be cheaper than that. Okay. Uh, what's your gut tell you? I think that that's another one that's probably a 50-50 because okay. if another team, he is really athletic and he has some good tape, there may be some teams out there that are willing to pay more money than that tender tag if he becomes an unrestricted free agent. 
Uh, but I, I just have a hard time believing that Mike McDonald and his staff are going to look at the tape and be like, this guy can be an impact player for us off the edge because he's just, he's a one trick pony. You yeah. can't, you can't trust him on early downs, unfortunately. Okay. Uh, Mafe uh, had a really nice season, led the team with nine sacks. Nwosu, unfortunately, did not, but that after a huge 2022 season because of uh, the pectoral injury week seven. Um, so is there just hope that he's going to be fine? He should be okay. And even that, even though that looks like that might be the case, um, there's still going to be a need for another edge guy or they hope and haul takes the big jump. They're going to be hoping that Hall is able to take a jump. And, and it, I saw some significant improvement from him as a run defender as his rookie season went on. So unlike Daryl Taylor, you were seeing some progress there. The pass rush, there wasn't much, but he did a lot at Auburn. I'm anticipating that's a guy near two that could take a significant jump. Boy, Mafe has a chance to be an absolute star in this league. He's still figuring out how to play the game. And he had a really good sophomore season. Uchenna Nuosu was playing well before his injury. The numbers might not have bored out, but he was playing at a high level still. So getting him back, he's going to be fully recovered. So those three, I think they're feeling good about. This is still a position, though, where I think you can supplement in the draft. Or if you want to bring in somebody like a Jadevian Clowney who – had a resurgence last year in Baltimore playing for Mike McDonald. The Seahawks had him in 2019. He has the length that McDonald covets off the edge. So that might be somebody that you can get at a decent price point that can immediately bolster your edge position. It would be a nice compliment to the other players they have. All right. Uh, let's uh, also talk about the inside linebacker uh, group here. All three top guys are are unrestricted free agents. You've touched up on Wagner a little bit. Another big 183 tackle season. Uh, Brooks 111 tackles. So both are, are are free agents. Bush is also a free agent. But of course, the big questions that need to be answered are between Brooks and Wagner. Yeah, I think that ultimately Jordan Brooks is the one the Seahawks want to bring back. And it's understandable. He's a former first-round pick. He's only 26. Last year, he had a miraculous recovery from a torn ACL that was suffered in January, and he started in week one. Played most of the games. He had an ankle injury that was nagging him late in the year, but he's going to be more than a full year removed from that injury. So there's a lot of optimism that his best years are still ahead of him. The question is going to be, with this being a somewhat weak linebacker draft class, if he hits free agency, they're going to be desperate teams looking for proven experienced linebackers. His price point may go way higher than many people anticipate. So he is one that I think you've got to get locked up before the start of free agency. Don't even put yourself in a position where you could end up in a bidding war to bring him back because – I am excited to see him playing in Mike McDonald's defense. There have been a lot of rumors out there. The Ravens preferred Jordan Brooks over Patrick Queen, and the Seahawks took Brooks before the Ravens were up the next pick, and they picked Patrick Queen. Queen became an all-pro last year. So Mike McDonald may be very excited to finally get <laughs> yeah. a chance to coach this guy that the Ravens coveted in the draft a few years back. So he is a player that I think they're absolutely putting at the top of their list, along with Leonard Williams. Let's try to get him re-signed. All right. And uh, what what is the feeling right now regarding Bobby Wagner? I think this is going to be a slow played process for him. I don't expect anybody's going to be rushing to sign him early in free agency, at least with big money. And this is kind of going to be a situation where you wait and see if you're the Seahawks, because he isn't the same athlete that he was when sure, he was 27, yeah. 28 years old. There are some issues in coverage as a result, but he's still a really good football player. He deserved second team all pro honors like he got last year. I mean, he is still a plus run defender. The leadership that he brings in the locker room, there are plenty of reasons to bring him back, but I think he is at the stage of his career where teams are going to be looking at younger guys and then once you've made a number of your big moves and you've re-signed some of your players, you can re-explore the possibility of bringing him back. I would expect it would be later in free agency. Now, on the other video, you had linebacker as the uh, number one need on the team this offseason. So um, what kind of traits are we looking at at the linebacker position? What, what most of all do you think McDonald's going to want from their, from their new linebacker? 
This is why I have some pessimism about the idea of Bobby Wagner coming back. I think he wants really athletic playmakers. That's what he had in Baltimore. He asks a lot of his linebackers in his scheme yeah. too. And I just don't know at this point in his career, if Bobby Wagner is going to be able to physically athletically be able to do the things that Mike McDonald is asking of his linebackers, he would have to make some adjustments to his scheme to be able to cater to Bobby Wagner's strengths. Not that Mike McDonald can't do that or wouldn't be willing to do that, but I think he's going to be looking for explosive athletes. Jordan Brooks is an explosive athlete. So Jordan Brooks would make sense. Devin Bush coming back on a one-year deal for league minimum. He is really athletic, but he just hasn't been the same player since he tore his ACL his second season. So I would anticipate that's a position they're going to be either looking in free agency. Oh, by the way, Patrick Queen is a free agent coming from the Ravens. He might look to reunite with him in Seattle. And the draft, it's not a great draft class overall, but there are some guys on day two that could make some sense for the Seahawks. That could be plug-and-play options. I I, I got to believe that that's – you mentioned Queen. I have to believe that is a a really good match – you know, if everybody's thinking about Penix and, and Seattle, I, I, I can see them thinking Queen in Seattle as well. Makes a lot of sense. So. It would. And the thing that Seahawks fans have to understand is they're not going to be bringing back Jordan Brooks and signing Patrick Queen. That's it. I expect Patrick Queen is going to fetch top dollar on the free agent market. So if you're going to bring in Queen, it's likely going to be at the expense of a player like Jordan Brooks. And then you would have to draft your other guy or – if you bring back Bobby Wagner and you put him with Patrick Queen, you know, those two guys for a season could potentially work. Again, though, you're going to have to make some adjustments scheme-wise sure. to fit with what Bobby Wagner does best now at this stage of his career. And like we said before, the thing that Mike McDonald wants, though, is he does want some highly intelligent players back there. And there ain't nobody more intelligent than uh, Bobby Wagner, that's for sure. Maybe having somebody back there, not that he's been around the defense and with McDonald, I mean, that would be something that you could. But the guy has, he's played everything. So. Yep. All right. Now uh, let's wrap up with the defensive backs and with a spoon and uh, woolen, you can't have, uh, you know, you can't expect much more than that at this stage in their careers back-to-back home runs in the draft, just a matter of just uh, enjoying them, being healthy, and so forth. So we know that that's the strength. But what about the rest of the unit? Because there are some free agents. you got restricted free agent Michael Jackson. You've got uh, unrestricted free agent Burns. And Trey Brown uh, was the number three last year. Uh, Do they want to just bring back what they had, or do they want to – make sure that they have somebody that they feel can be a little bit better than Trey Brown, or are they satisfied with Trey Brown? I think Trey Brown, this is truly, you know, we talk about this with free agents. You are playing for your future when you're in the last year of your deal. And I think Trey Brown is very much in that category. Now I actually think Mike Jackson of the unrestricted or the restricted free agents. I think that he has the best chance to get tendered because he was a really solid starter two years ago. And If Devin Witherspoon is going to be playing some of his snaps inside, Reek Woolen and Mike Jackson on the outside might make the most sense, especially with the corners that have succeeded in Mike McDonald's system. Mike Jackson is just that physical. He's not the best athlete, but he's that physical press cover guy that can come up and hit people in the run game. He just has a lot of the characteristics that I think Mike McDonald is going to be excited about. So I would think that this group is going to look very much the same. Maybe they add a guy that can play some in the slot on day three in the draft, but I don't expect this to be a position where there's going to be a lot of changes. Okay. And it's really the only player that hasn't really developed as well as they would like. Is that Kobe Bryant? Well, the injuries have been a part of that. He was banged up most of last year. They tried working him at safety. So maybe he's going to get that opportunity now with Jamal Adams and Quandre Diggs being out of town. He is somebody, though, that is going to maybe be battling for a roster spot in Mike McDonald's defense. If he can show that he can play safety at a high level along with outside and back, then that's valuable to this defense. But I think he's a guy going into year three that he may very well be playing for his roster spot, especially if they draft a corner at some point that they bring in to add to this group. And then uh, Love, of course, uh, you talked about him, and he's had a, a, a great uh, couple of uh, seasons now, but there is a big hole 
after what happened yesterday. So how do you think they're going to take care of that other spot opposite love or how would they like to, do you think a veteran or the draft? I think that they're, this is a different position than some of the others where I feel like free agency, this is going to be a spot that they are aggressive. And I think part of the reason that they were willing to move on from Quandre Diggs the way they did is that this is just such a good free agent crop that I think the saturation is going to bring some of the price points down. You're going to be able to get some really good young safeties without breaking the bank necessarily. Now, if you want somebody like a Xavier McKinney, who would be my first pick, not Geno Stone, he has played with Julian Love. So that would be a really interesting pairing to bring to Seattle. McKinney had the best year of his career last year, even though the Giants were bad. He was a bright spot in that football team, still only 25 years old. Him or Geno Stone, maybe somebody like a Julian Blackman, who's going to be a free agent, had a really good year for the Colts last year. I mean, there are a lot of young safeties that are going to be hitting the market that have had really good production in the NFL. So this is a position that I think John Schneider, he's as good as any GM out there at managing his positions based on what he expects to be available in free agency. And I think they decided to move on from both their veteran safeties because they looked at this group and thought, hey, I might be able to get myself a really good deal for a really good football player that could be a foundational piece for us. And then maybe you can bring back somebody like a Ryan Neal on a veteran minimum deal to add some experience to that secondary as well. You could draft a guy. There's a lot of possibilities, but this is a position group I expect they're going to be aggressive in free agency with. So Leonard Williams, he's the top priority free agent, correct? I'd have him at number one and I'd have Jordan Brooks at number two. Okay. And, but Brooks could also be, do, do you think that it's quite possible that they're thinking about queen and let's see what we can possibly do there. Or do you think they're more like, well, let's see if we can just get Brooks signed. And if we can't, then we'll talk to queen. I think it would be the latter. I think they really want to get something done with Brooks because the organization understands that Patrick queen is coming off an all pro season that is going to push his price tag up. And you don't get the luxury of negotiating with an outside free agent right now. You have that luxury with Jordan Brooks. So I think they're trying to hammer that out behind the scenes. And if it doesn't work out, hey, we might be willing to pay a little more money now for a player that we know has thrived in Mike McDonald's defense at Patrick Queen. Okay, and if they do not, now let's say they do get, either way, that uh, let's say they sign Brooks, but they don't sign Williams. What do they do? What do you, is there some someone else out there, another player out there, or position out there that you think that they would, use, they would want to use that money on? Well, I don't know that they would splurge in free agency on a defensive tackle. I think that'd be a position that they would attack in the draft, okay. even if Leonard Williams is signed. That may be a position that they're still looking fairly early in the draft. I I still think free agency right now that I would rank safety as number one. Linebacker is number two. I think those are the two position groups that they're going to be looking at closely, especially if Jordan Brooks isn't re-signed before free agency. And then on offense, I don't know if they're going to be willing to spend money at guard or center. They haven't in the past, but this is not the same regime. John Schneider, this is his show now. Yeah. Carroll's not there, whether you want to say being, being involved or, or hamstringing. I mean, some fans think that Pete Carroll might have been hamstringing John Schneider a little bit with him being the director of personnel. But now that this is all John Schneider's show, I could see them changing things up and saying, you know what? We are going to spend some money now on our interior offensive line. So those would be the positions. If they're going to be big spenders in free agency, I don't anticipate they're going to be. Safety would be the one position that I would bet on, though. They're going to be looking to make a little bit of a splash because there is so much talent there and they might be able to get a really good deal. Let's wrap up with uh, free uh, special teams. So everybody is back. Uh, no free agents there, except in returning uh, uh, with uh, DJ Dallas uh, and Eskridge, like you said, may not be there as well. So it looks like to me on paper that uh, it, it, the team could be looking for a new punt returner or kick returner unless Dallas is resigned. Is everybody back after that? I expect that this is the position that's going to have very little change. You might draft somebody that can be your new kick or punt returner. It'd be nice to have a little more juice back there. That was the one issue with DJ Dallas. He wasn't that home run hitting threat. He could give you some really good returns, but he just doesn't have that next gear to really do damage on special teams. So I think that's a spot. D Eskridge has flashed there 
in very brief spurts. He has legitimate four, three speed, but they just haven't been able to keep him healthy. He hasn't been somebody that they can, they can count on. So I think that they're going to be looking at, at players in this draft that have that ability to return kicks and maybe free agency. That could be a spot they look at somebody that's a second tier player on offense or defense, but can return kicks. I expect they're going to be looking for an upgrade, especially now with the new kick rules that look like you're going to be in play. that are going to increase the number of kickoffs. At least that's the intention. I think they're going to want somebody that's more explosive back there. Corbin, appreciate it. Great job as always. And uh, as we wrap up, just want to remind everybody, you've got the Locked On uh, Seahawks podcast that is available five to six days a week. And uh, where can you get that? And again, we're going to leave a link in the description for it. But oh, uh, you can get that uh, on all the devices, including YouTube. Yeah, you can watch our show on YouTube. Our video cast version, our audio version is on all platforms. So whether you're on Apple Music or you're on Google Podcasts, whatever platform that you listen to, wherever you get your podcast, you can su subscribe for free to Locked On Seahawks. Excellent. Really appreciate it as always, like I said, Corbin, and we look forward to talking to you at some point, maybe uh, after the draft and, of course, before the season begins. Sounds good. Thanks, Greg. You got it.